Okay, so week three, this is an introduction to the cerebellum. And just a couple of research articles, just as a reminder for plasticity. Uh, a couple of the excerpts from this article in particular, enhancing plasticity in the adult brain is an exciting prospect. And there is certainly evidence emerging that suggest the possible use of epigenetic factors to induce a younger brain. And recent findings support a key role of epigenetic factors in mediating the effects of sensory experience on site-specific gene expression, synaptic transmission, and behavioral phenotypes. So I like this little picture here because it's a reminder that we are in our, we are our environment. Um, we have our genes that we're born with, but then the genetic expression can be determined by the environment and the stimulation. So if you don't do good things like the guy on the right, you don't feel good or look good. If you do good things, feel better, look better, hopefully and potentially. But what are the three things that a neuron needs to, for, to survive from last week? If we remember, we need oxygen, we need glucose, and we need stimulation. One more nice little article from 2009. Animal studies have established that plasticity within the somatosensory cortex begins immediately following peripheral nerve transection, and that one year after complete nerve transection and surgical repair, the cortical maps contain patchy, non-continuous representations of the transected and adjacent nerves. So basically, everything that happens in the peripheral, peripheral system, such as like our sensory areas of the arm, the leg, it can have a central effect. Here we've demonstrated for the first time that there is a functional plasticity in both gray and white matter, structural abnormalities in several cortical, cortical areas following upper limb, peripheral nerve transection, and surgical repair. So we are sensory beings. We need, we need proper sensory stimulation. Okay, the cerebellum. So this is a great little image here, and you'll see it again. But this is the anatomy and functional areas of the brain. We're going to do a little bit of the cortex uh, this week too, but I don't want to touch on it too much because Dr. Klein's doing that in her class. But here we have the cerebellum, and if we uh, zoom in there, you see that it just sits right behind the occipital lobe and part of the temporal lobe. Uh, but a very important area, if you look down at the bottom left corner here of the screen, you see that the motor functions responsible for the cerebellum are coordination of movement, balance and equilibrium and posture, as I'm sure all of you, all of you know. But, you know, some really amazing things too with the cerebellum. Uh, I have some case studies I'll share with you, but a new one that just came in in particular was cerebellar issues in speech. So the cerebellum is responsible for helping coordinate speech as well, and it's also responsible for help coordinating thought. Uh, it's it plays a role in the immune system. So the cerebellum is a pretty amazing little piece of the nervous system. Uh, has a huge impact. So just looking at other areas of the cerebellum here, um, we have different pictures. So we have the cross sections and you see that the anterior lobe is up top here and the posterior lobe. Um, the somatic makeup, you're gonna see anterior lobe is more responsible for the legs and then the posterior lobe is responsible for more of the, the hands and the face. So if you ever have seen someone walk out of the bar and they're stumbling, we know that there could be degeneration in their anterior cerebellum because they start to lose the ability of using their legs well. So the cerebellum has between 1 to 100 billion neurons that communicate with the cortex. The cerebellum relies heavily on stimulation. Uh, increased muscle spindle feedback, like we talked about last week, it leads to increased cerebellar output. And there's intimate connections with the vestibular system that help the cerebellum learn spatial orientation and perception of movement. So what happens when the cerebellum isn't working as good as it should? You have loss of ability to coordinate fine movements, loss of ability to walk, inability to reach out and grab objects. You may see tremors, dizziness, slurred speech, and uh, inability to make rapid movements. You may have uh, discoordinated thoughts. You could have discoordinated speech. Like I said, there is a ton of things that the cerebellum is responsible for that a lot of people don't really even recognize. So some important functional areas of the cerebellum, we've got your spinocerebellum, your vestibulocerebellum, and your cerebrocerebellum. The spinocerebellum's responsibilities include regulation of muscle tone for posture and locomotion, and also balance. What the patient may complain of when they come in, if they have a spinocerebellar functional lesion or issues in the neurophysiology behind the functioning of the spinocerebellum, they may have some difficulty with balance, difficulty walking in the dark, difficulty going downstairs, or they may sway to one side while they're walking. Uh, you'll also see a wide base gait, um, a sway in a Romberg's position when they put their feet together with their eyes open and closed. It may not be a positive Romberg's when they fall or take a step, but you may see a sway. And Typically, when you see a sway, there is some dysfunction in that area of the cerebellum. 
So just testing some of the spinocerebellar uh, areas. Test to remove visual input so that postural balance must be maintained entirely based on vestibular sense and position sense. Can you please stand with your feet close together, touching each other? And now close your eyes, please. Very good. Keep your eyes closed. And right there, he's doing a pull test and a push test to see if she's able to coordinate reactivity of muscles to stay upright in her posture. You'll see pull tests done for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. She, had, she did not have a positive pull test or a positive Romberg. She was pretty good. This guy's a little bit um, monotone, so I'm trying to let you watch the whole things. Coordination of gait for spinal cerebellum. Walk towards me, please. So watching the patient walk. Turn around, please, and walk towards the wall. And like I said, what you may see is a walk wide base gait. Walk please. But walking can, can around, give you a lot of good information. When the patient comes into the clinic, uh, you're looking to see if there's coordinated arm swing, if there's cross-crawl activity between the left upper, right lower, and the right upper, left lower. And then again, you're looking for wide base gait or just to see what their posture is like. Do they have an anterior lean, a kyphosis, a head tilt? All of, the, all of those things can tell you that there could be some dysfunction in the nervous system. So what do you see here? This lady's trying to walk, but she has what's called cerebellar ataxia. So she typically uses a walker, um, and so she needs assistance with walking, but she's got a wide base gait. It's not coordinated. Uh, it doesn't look that great. So she needs some, she needs some cerebellar help. Uh, what do you see here? So this lady here, I believe, is going to close her eyes, and then you start to see a sway, right? And that's actually a positive Romberg's from the conventional side of medicine because she had to take a step. If she just swayed significantly and was able to catch herself, then we would call that a functional neurophysiological change in the cerebellum. That would need rehab. So what can you do? Uh, you have to have the patient perform balance exercises. So a good rule of thumb in the clinic is have them perform what they're not good at. So if they are not good at Rombergs, they practice their Rombergs with eyes open, eyes closed in a safe area. You have them practice one like standing, BOSU ball exercises, foam pad exercises, balance board exercises. You just want to challenge the system because the system will become more efficient as long as you challenge it. You want to increase your core stability. You know, your core muscles, uh, they fire into your spinal cerebellar pathways and they need they need good information. I, I, I'm pretty sure 99% of us aren't getting good core activation every day. And then increase proprioception, so do adjustments. Uh, adjustments have shown simulation to the ipsilateral side, so like an adjustment to the ipsilateral upper or lower extremity or on one side of the spine, will fire into the ipsilateral cerebellum, uh, specifically more of the, the intermediate and mediate, um, medial cerebellar pathways. So the vestibular cerebellum, some of the responsibilities is regulation of the, of the vestibular system, uh, regulation of balance, and then assistance with eye movements. So encoding what's called retinal slip. We don't have to know too much about that, but it basically helps with your eye movements. There, the patient may come in and complain of postural muscle fatigue, dizziness, disorientation, difficulty riding in a car, or nausea, especially with head movements or body movements. On examination, again, you'll see some spinocerebellar stuff, so wide base gait and sway in Romberg's. You may see nystagmus, that, that's not normal, um, an, an impaired vestibulo-ocular reflex, impaired smooth pursuits, and hypermetric saccades, because the cerebellum, again, remember, it's the guy that or gal that is responsible for coordinating movements. So if there is an in coordination of a movement, you might not see smooth pursuits, or you might see saccades or fast eye movements that aren't hitting the target the way they should because the movement isn't coordinated like it should be. So for the vestibular cerebellum, you can test some of the cranial nerves, uh, three, four, and six. You're testing eye movements. I'm not quite sure why my video is not working, but basically he's doing the cardinal fields of gaze or the H in space. Uh, this is just a cool depiction of what a pursuit is uh, for a rule of thumb for anyone that's interested when you're doing a pursuit to one side you're stimulating the ipsilateral side parietal lobe so if you're testing a patient's right pursuit so if they're following your H in space to the right you're actually seeing how the right parietal lobe is working and then you're also seeing how the opposite uh, cerebellar pathway is working too and you can see that here you've got this one side cerebellum and the opposite side, uh, parietal lobe. <clears throat>
And then this is a staccato or a fast eye movement. I just like to throw these in here, but you're gonna have the opposite. So the left frontal lobe is gonna push the eyes over to the right side and vice versa. So we'll talk about that later. Um, but again, just because the cerebellum is responsible for doing so much of the coordination, I think it's responsible to see some of that. So the VOR, uh, hopefully this video plays. Consciousness. The eye movements, as well as the vestibular system, can be tested with the oculocephalic maneuver, in which the head is moved side to side. It's important to ensure that there's been no cervical trauma prior to performing this Make sure this we're maneuver. recording here. Oops, sorry guys. The head is turned rapidly from side to side while observing the patient's eye movements. It can also be done moving the head forward and back. In the normal conscious individual, the reflex eye movements in the opposite direction of the head turning are not seen. So for a VOR, what you're looking for is a coordinated equal and opposite movement of the eyes. And we'll talk about that in the future um, because the, the reason I want to talk about it from a neurophysiological standpoint is pain is integrated in an area in the brainstem that's also responsible for coordinating a lot of these movements. So on the clinical exam, if you see changes in this, you can see changes in pain pathways or changes in representations of pain. So some important stuff. Here's a little uh, schematic of the VOR. Basically, if you're activating the left horizontal canal, your eyes should fire over to the right. So there should be an opposite, equal and opposite movement and vice versa if you're activating the right. So this is actually kind of looking up underneath the eyes your eyes should move equally and opposite to the left. And here they've got eye movements to the left activated by a right canal. Okay, next slide. And again, you don't need to know this for the tests. I just like to show everyone this stuff. I think it's important um, just from a cerebellar standpoint. So what we're looking for again is just equal and opposite eye movements. Um, when you're doing or testing the VOR. So in this patient here, what you should see is a nice smooth pursuit, right? The patient can coordinate the movement very nicely. Uh, we're checking the cranial nerves. Specifically, we're checking the right lateral rectus, the right medial rectus, and vice versa, uh, just seeing if there's a nice coordinated movement. So eye movement review. Uh, for anyone that wants to really get honed in on their cranial nerves. Medial rectus right here is gonna pull the eyes in. So if you're testing accommodation or convergence, you're, you're looking at the medial rectus muscles. Uh, it's innervated by cranial nerve three or ocular motor. Lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six on both sides, it's gonna pull the eye out. Superior rectus, just the origin of the eye muscles and the eyes in the orbit. It's gonna move your eyes a little bit up and out, cranial nerve three. The inferior rectus, cranial nerve 3, is going to move it down and out. And then superior rectus, I'm sorry, superior oblique is cranial nerve 4, your trochlear, and it's going to move it down and in. And the inferior oblique is up and in, and that's cranial nerve 3, and vice versa. So I may ask a couple questions on eye movements because I think it's important, especially if you're doing a neurological exam in your office. And here's just a picture of how the muscles are all uh, sitting in the eye. Uh, just some people always get confused on this. The superior oblique, it moves your eye down and in, and it's innervated by trochlear. So just to I remember there, I'll probably ask that guy on the test. Superior oblique, cranial nerve 4. So what can you do if you see changes in the vestibular cerebellum? Have the patient perform what are called gaze stability exercises. So if you see difficulty in the VOR, if you see changes in the eye movements, you'll have them sit at um, some dots facing the wall about arm's length away and just have them focus on the dot while they're moving their head side to side and up and down. If anyone in the clinic is interested in learning more about this, we can do a little video on that, but that's not going to be on the test. Rotational exercises will activate the VOR and the ipsilateral side cerebellum. Um, so what you want to do is activate the side that's not working as good. So if you see some right cerebellar issues or a right VOR issue, you want to activate that area. So you'll do right chair spins. And then you'll, you can provide optokinetic stimulation. Uh, so what you would do is, again, activate the areas that aren't working that good. 
if you see difficulty in an eye movement to the right, you want to have them do that, and you can do that with an optokinetic tape. That's not a question on your test. Cerebrocerebellum. The responsibilities of the cerebrocerebellum are coordination of fine movements, coordination of speech, coordination of thought. The patient may complain of some clumsiness with their hands or feet. They, they may be walking around and tripping over their feet. Handshaking with intention. So they go in for a handshake and you notice a tremor at the end, um, which is called an intention or uh, tremor when they're going in for the handshake. And then when they're ending the handshake, that's termination tremor. Dysmetria. So if you have them do what's called finger to nose and they can't perform that good. Uh, if you see some breakdown in the movement, or dystidocokinesia, where you try to have them do a rapid, a rapid alternating movement and they can't do it smoothly. So I can post some videos on that if anyone's interested, but just know that that's what you may see on the exam. So here's a rapid alternating okay, movement. Please take your hand and tap your thigh like this, and with the back of your hand like that, and then the other side alternating as quickly as you can, as fast as you can. Now with the other hand, please. Very good. So she was actually a little faster with her left hand compared to her right, but she could do both of them. So they would say, hey, that looks good, but functionally, her right side isn't as good as her left, and she may have some right cerebellar issues as well. Finger-to-nose testing. Can you please, uh, with your right index finger, touch your nose, and then touch my finger. Touch your nose and go back and forth as fast as you can. It's important to ensure that the patient uses the full extent of their reach when doing this test and to bring out more subtle abnormalities. I'm now going to make the test harder by moving my finger each time. Very good. So what you're looking on that is, again, to see if there's a tremor at the beginning of the movement or an ending at the movement to make sure that she can hit uh, her nose accurately and the examiner's nose. But just a good test, and again, ipsilateral side is the side of the lesion. This is another side for uh, dysmetria. Uh, another test, I'm sorry, for dysmetria. Put it on your knee and drag it down the straight line to your big toe and back up again. Just like this. There you go. Straight down to your toe and back up again. Down to your toe and back up again. Very good. Now let's do the same thing on the other side. So you're looking for a breakdown in the smoothness of the movement. And up again. And down, very good. So if she couldn't do that very smoothly, which it looked like she could from, from my point of view, but if there was some almost choppiness in the movement, then you would think ipsilateral side cerebellum could be the issue. Can you put your arms and your thighs like this, please? When I say go, I want you to please pick up both your arms to the level of my hand right there and hold them right there, please. Okay, ready? Go. So if she couldn't do that. Pick your arms up above your head, and when I say go, please bring both arms down quickly and stop right at the level of my hand. Ready? Go. So, in a in a severe cerebellar case, someone couldn't do that. But another way to bring out the lesion is you could have them uh, bring their arms up, and then you say, "Close your eyes, and I want you to try and." Close your eyes, bring your arms back down by your side, and I want you to try to bring your arms back up to the same spot. If you notice that they can't do that, then there could be some changes in the way that the cerebellum and the brain are coordinating the movement. So what do you see here? This gentleman's trying to perform that diadochokinetic movement, that rapid alternating movement, but he can't. He's got a slowness in movement. He, he just can't do it. So that right side cerebellum is just not working that good. So what can you do? Have the patient perform the coordinated movements that they're not good at. So to activate the lateral side of the cerebellum, a lot of finger, hand, uh, foot, and toe activation is going to get that area moving. So if you see that they're not good with finger to nose on the right, have them try finger to nose. You can have them move their hand around um, playing the piano, an imaginary piano. They could learn the guitar, um, anything like that, just to activate that area. And that's that same paper that I had in there. But like I said earlier, everything peripheral has a central consequence. So if you cut a nerve, if you damage an area of the body, you're going to have changes in the brain, and the brain's not going to be able to perform those areas that need to move or, or need to groove as good as they could. So you've got to get in there and stimulate and activate those areas. So here's a case study on cerebellar ataxia. 
I had a 54 year old lady came come into our clinic. <clears throat> she actually came in for a chiropractic exam. And, um, well, let me tell you this first. She woke up one morning over one year ago with vertigo. It was, it was actually a year and two months by the time she saw us. She has difficulty uh, with walking and her balance. She sometimes resorts to using a cane and extreme difficulty walking downstairs. So one morning she woke up and she basically said she almost fell over because she was so dizzy. So she went to, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. She went to an Emory clinic uh, for vestibular rehabilitation and they couldn't really figure anything out. Um, and basically what happened was she just ended up resorting to using a cane to assist her walking. So we have our patients fill out all these forms, um, which if anyone's ever interested, I can send you guys the forms. But the patient was really proactive uh, in her health. She was losing a lot of weight, uh, but this really set, uh, it was a huge speed bump for her. And she hasn't been able to exercise. When she came to see us, she had lost 45 pounds and she was trying to lose more, but she couldn't because she could barely walk. <clears throat> she had been to several rehab clinics, like I said, and, and nothing really helped her. So I had her fill out the forms. These are brain assessment forms. They tell us different areas of the, of the brain that should be working. And if they're not, then I usually look for those areas on exam. A three is bad, zero is good for us. And the only three she had were the, the section 11 CB, which stands for cerebellum. So difficulty with balance that's really notably worse on one side and a need to hold a handrail or watch your step very carefully. So just another interesting fact about this patient, she is an avid theater goer. So she, we have the Fox Theater right next to our clinic and where she works. And um, those stairs are very steep. So even going to see a show was, was brutal for her. And she also is an avid cruise patient person. I don't even know what to say about that. She she goes on cruises two to three or four times a year. So this really just it really set her back. And she's young, single, 54-year-old lady uh, looking to retire soon and enjoy her life. So when she came in, she had a very wide base gait. She was using her cane and she was looking for regular chiropractic care. But I started to talk to her about functional neurology and you know what neurology rehab could do for her. So provocative Romberg testing produced significant sway uh, when I put her head positioned in the right posterior and left anterior canal. When she was describing her issue to me, it sounded like her canals weren't working as well as they should. Um, and then her right cerebellum. So she had some finger to nose issues on her right side. She couldn't do coordinated toe tapping with her right foot. So we had to do um, some therapy to fix that. So what did we do? We did a right posterior canal repositioning maneuver. So for anyone that's not familiar, it's called an Epley's. I'm not sure you guys all know that. And then we did some right cerebellar novel exercises. The reason I put novel in there is because the brain loves novelty. So we did different right cerebellar exercises every day. And then of course we did some chiropractic adjustments. Um, the reason we had to look at her canals first is because the way she described it to me, she had had some sort of BPPV a year and two months ago before seeing us, but it may have gotten cleared with the therapy. But like I said, remember, anything that is peripheral has a central consequence. And if there's changes in the vestibular system, you can see changes in the cerebellum as well. So I think that her vestibular system was working better but not as good as it could have been. And then the cerebellum had been compensating, became fatigued, and it needed the exercises that we do in the clinic. So after her first day, she had marked improvement in balance. Uh, she, she was very comfortable walking and standing and ability to walk downstairs without holding a handrail. And she actually also just, uh, she ran two 5Ks on her last cruise ship about three weeks ago. So she's doing great, no cane. Simple, simple cerebellar stuff that you guys can do in your office. This is another interesting case. This is, uh, uh, his name's Aaron Hill. He's actually a pretty famous veteran, but he came to see us and that's his uh, wife, Aaron. Basically, long story short, I'll let you guys read this if you want, but he uh, he's, a, he's a retired EOD tech. Uh, in 2011, an IED blew up about 11, 12 feet away from him and it literally blew his eyeballs out, so he became blind. Um, and he was adapting to living his life blind, but then in 2015, he developed bacterial meningitis, um, which, what I say, it chewed away at his vestibular centers. So it, it screwed up his vestibular and balance centers so bad that he lost his hearing. Um, so now he's blind and deaf, and they had to do a cochlear implant, which the left took, the right didn't. So he could hear very minimally out of his left ear by the time he saw us. But of course, 
that didn't stop Aaron. He uh, he became a marathoner. So he was running Boston Marathon. But as you can imagine, there was a lot of fatigue that set in when he couldn't move uh, efficiently or use all of his senses that he needed to. So just like anything else, if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, it is true, especially in neurology. And just a good example of that is we've got a big, fat, healthy brain here. Um, and on the back side too, you see a nice, big, fat, healthy brain. But when we look at the front of this brain, you see some changes in the gyri. There's bigger shape, I'm sorry, bigger spaces. Uh, there's less folds. And this is actually the brain of an Alzheimer's patient that has frontal degeneration. So I just put this up here so you could kind of get a visual image, but we have to think about what was happening to his balance centers um, after he lost visual input, after he lost vestibular input, and had the meningitis. So what do we have to do to a brain on the left compared to the brain on the right? We've got to activate it. We've got to give it some good loving. And just as you all, I'm sure, know, if your frontal lobe doesn't work good, then you lose some things like you have mood changes, changes in social behavior, changes in your personality, difficulty with problem solving. All those things could, could be affected. To go back to last week, um, I, I took all the I think it's important because the receptors, I feel like they don't get the loving they deserve. But if you're going to do stimulation in your office uh, and you're going to use neurophysiology, you can use the different receptors to as a pathway to get into the nervous system and stimulate it appropriately. So the A-beta-mechano receptors like uh, Merkel's and Meisner's and Ruffini's and Pacinian, I'm a big fan of the Pacinian because I think vibration's great. So we use those uh, to stimulate Aaron's centers, right? Just to get some stimulation into his body. Uh, we use some muscle spindle activation uh, with chiropractic adjustments and stretching. And then we also activated the, the GTOs, the Golgi tendon organs, just to slowly get some good stimulation into a fatigued system. So <clears throat> after several months of his rehab, he learned how to be really good at being blind, as he said. Although he couldn't see, his balance was no major issue. Um, but then in 2015, like I said, he got really sick and he developed bacterial meningitis. So this is a video, I won't play it, but this is a video and Aaron found out that he was legitimately deaf from the um, meningitis. And then this is, this is a video of his uh, now wife, Michaela. The meningitis obliterated his hearing and left him completely deaf for five months. So think about that sensory deprivation to the system. Not only that, the meningitis uh, wreaked havoc on his balance centers and he suffered very severe vertigo and he couldn't, he could barely stand or walk. So here's a video of him just trying to walk to the gate from his house. We made it to the gate this morning. He was not happy in that video. Mika Michaela was. Michaela's always happy, but Aaron was not happy because this guy is a guy that wants to run the Boston Marathon. So after recovering from his meningitis, um, in this video you can see that he's walking on a treadmill. Uh, it took a lot out of him though. And I put in here, remember metabolic capacity. And what metabolic capacity is, is basically, you know, how well can a neuron fire with the proper oxygen, glucose, and stimulation? And because he was getting some oxygen and getting some glucose, he just had, hadn't had the stimulation yet, his metabolic capacity was not great. But he worked on it, right? He has a lot of work to do, but he started getting on um, the treadmill more. He actually ran uh, one of his best times in Ohio. Uh, but the problem was every little change in pace and every little mo movement was a really big calibration for his system. Uh, it just it fatigued him. So even after he did run a marathon after his meningitis, he became so fatigued that he basically had to lay in his room for like a month or something to recover. But here you go. He's now picking up the speed, running, doing well, um, starting to kick butt. <clears throat> this is his saying, uh, challenge accepted. I just like this. I think it's inspiring. I already see each day as a gift, but coupled out with the facts that life was nearly stolen from me a few times and how amazing my life is today, it's very easy to... Sorry, I'm sitting in my office and there's traffic. Uh, easy to lace up each morning and attack the day. So he came to the clinic and what did we do? Well, we worked on core activation, right? We wanted to fire those spinocerebellar pathways. And he hated this exercise, just like everyone does. I usually save uh, my core for the last exercise, but... Um, 
and never make it to it. But these are just videos of him doing core exercises. This is us together in the clinic uh, working just on some perturbed surfaces balance. Uh, I just wanted him to feel differences in the floor. So we had him working on an Eric's pad, a BOSU ball, this little rocker pad here. Uh, and we just wanted to just to stimulate the system. And he started to do really good. So these were updates uh, from from his wife. She was basically telling us that, you know, he was starting to get faster and faster and feel better and and move better, and um, that was huge for Aaron. So he's making improvements. He's running. He's holding on with one hand, but he's able to coordinate a movement to get some water to his mouth now. And then we we put him in the gyro stem. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but. What we did was, th this was interesting, uh, just for anyone that's interested, <clears throat> we had him spin in specific directions, and at first he couldn't figure out which way he was spinning because he had no affrontation to his system. So I would spin him forward, and sometimes he would say, oh, I'm going backwards, or I'd spin him to the right, and he'd say, I'm going left. But what we did was we would activate the movement, so I'd spin him, and I'd say, hey, you're going to the right, you're going to the right. And over time, he started to be able to sense the direction. So just activating those systems. And I'll show you a quick clip of this, but he's a he's a military guy, so he wanted the high speed. So we typically don't go this fast with everyone, but um, he kicked butt. So we did a very quick 30-second spin in all different directions. And you can't hear him in this video, but he would shout out left, right, back left, back right, and just tell us which direction he was going, which was pretty amazing, all, all things considered. But he has a big smile on his face, and he loves it. So I asked his wife, I said, you know, what do you think of his progress? And she's like, well, I really don't know. You know, running on a treadmill is one thing, but, you know, going out for a run is another. So I took him out and we did a um, seven mile run and we paced it at eight minutes, which is pretty typical for him. But here we're just walking, we're working on our turns um, because, again, every little perturbation in the surface, it would throw off his vestibular system. So we're just out on a pathway in Atlanta, just working on turns, and um, and he's feeling good. He's moving good. So here's a funny video of him. Uh, this is we do this. Uh, it's called a, sharp, a sharpened Rombergs or tandem stance, where you put one foot in front of the other, and um, he's telling us how much better he got. So he's a jokester because, as you can see, he's leaning on his on his counter there. But he did get a lot better, um, and he continued to get better. He actually did really well this past year in the Boston Marathon. Um, this was actually, I'm sorry, this was two years ago when he did the Boston Marathon. He, his guide actually uh, crapped out at 20 miles, and he had to finish the race with another guide. So that his guide slowed him down, and he was upset about that. But he did really good. So just some simple cerebellar therapies for your office. Uh, spinning in a desk chair will stimulate the same side. A passive muscle stretch will stimulate the same side. Squeezing a tennis ball will stimulate the same side. Um, passive or active nonlinear complex movements, basically just drawing figure eights in the sky with the arm or the leg will activate the same side. And then finger to nose, so practicing finger to nose will activate the same side. Um, to activate that, that vestibulocerebellar and the spinocerebellar area, what you want to do is some gaze stabilization exercises like we talked about earlier. Wobble board balance beam exercises. If you don't have a balance beam, you can have the patient imagine they're on a balance beam. Bouncing or throwing a ball against the wall, doing planks and sit-ups, and then riding a bicycle, or doing what we call cross-crawl activity. So laying on their back and doing opposite hand to opposite knee, or doing it standing. To activate the lateral cerebellum, you can do cognitive exercises. They can learn a musical instrument, tracing a maze, playing catch, tapping fingers and hands or toes and feet to the beat of a metronome, uh, trying to write with eyes closed, or playing strategic board games. So just a reminder, the language of the brain is repetition. So when you do exercises in your clinic, you got you to gotta create repetitive action to get these muscles in the brain to create plasticity. So thanks so much, and this is part one of week three.